We now turn to the representation theory of the group SU2, which is the simplest non-abelian Lie group. So remember, SU2 is the special unitary group of two by two matrices. That is the determinants of these matrices is supposed to be one, and the matrices are unitary, which means M dagger M equals the identity, where dagger was this conjugate transpose. Take the transpose and you conjugate all the entries. There's a simpler way of writing this matrix in this case, because it's two by two, so it's not too bad. Um, they're the matrices A, B, minus B bar, A bar, where A and B are complex numbers, and the absolute value squared of A plus the absolute value squared of B is one. So this is a three-dimensional group because A and B each have real and imaginary parts, so there are four variables real of A, imaginary of A, real of B, imaginary of B, and the sum of squares of those guys equals one, that's this condition, the determinant equals one. So four variables, one condition, that cuts you down to three degrees of freedom, so it's a three-dimensional group. You can also see that for the Lie algebra, so the Lie algebra is little su2, the unitary condition becomes, upon differentiation, this condition that x dagger equals minus x, that's the anti-hermitian or skew-hermitian condition. And the fact that the determinant of m is 1 becomes the fact that the trace of x is 0. In other words, if you exponentiate something with trace 0, you get something with determinant 1. Again, there's an easier way to write these matrices. They are all of the form ix, y plus ix, minus y plus ix, minus ix. You can see the fact that these two diagonal entries are the same with opposite sides is the fact that the trace is zero. The fact that they're both imaginary is coming from this first condition. And the fact that the off diagonal terms are related by a sign change in the real part is again coming from this skew hermitian condition. So x, y, and z here are real numbers, three real parameters. So again, it's a three-dimensional Lie algebra. So there was one piece of notation that we introduced, um, which is uh, a notation for this matrix in the Lie algebra. So we wrote MV, where if V is X, Y, Z, then MV is this matrix here. Uh, I'll just copy and paste it. I, X, Y plus I, Z, minus Y plus I, Z, minus I, X. OK, so that's just a piece of notation we're going to use in a second. OK, what representations do we already know of this group? Well, a representation is a way of representing the group elements as matrices, and the group elements are two by two matrices. So it comes with what's known as the standard representation. This is just the map from SU2 to GL2C, taking the matrix AB minus a, a B bar A bar to itself, considered as a two by two complex matrix. Okay, so this is a representation. It's a two dimensional complex representation. It'll turn out it's irreducible. And that's somehow the basic representation of SU2. Are there any more? Well, yeah, we came across one more, right? Uh, we had this this thing that took um, an element of SU2, let's say G, and produced something which sent this matrix MV to GMV G inverse. So this is a bit of a funny way of writing something. We're sending an element of the group to a transformation that takes the matrix MV to G, MV, G inverse. So here's how I'm going to write this. This is an element of GL of little su2. In other words, it's taking an element of little su2, this MV, and it's producing a new element of su2, G, MV, G inverse, which it turns out you can write as M of something else. Um, so this this is a perfectly valid linear map of SU2. So here's this piece of notation. 
if V is a vector space, then GLV is going to denote the set of invertible linear maps from V to V. And this is a handy piece of notation because it lets us keep track of exactly which vector space it is we're working with. You know, GLC3, for example, is GL3, C. It's the group we were formerly calling GL3C, three by three complex matrices. But if you really write the vector space in there, you remember which vector space it is. It doesn't, you know, this notation GL3C just remembers the dimension and the field that you're working over. Uh, so this is a three-dimensional representation because V is a three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional vector, but currently it's a real representation because you know x, y, and z are real numbers. I'm really interested in complex representations, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write tensor C after SU two, and I, that just means I allow x, y, and z to be complex numbers. So this is now a three-dimensional complex representation that we studied in some detail in an earlier video. Okay, we have a two-dimensional representation, a three-dimensional representation. Are there any more? Well, there's a one-dimensional representation. This is the thing that takes a b c uh, a b minus b bar a bar to the one by one matrix one. That is a representation. If you multiply any two things and apply this representation, you get the identity. On the other hand, if you apply the representation to two things, you get the identity and the identity, which when you multiply them together gives the identity. So this is definitely a representation. It's one dimensional. It's also irreducible because any one dimensional thing is irreducible. It has no proper sub representations. There's just no space in a one-dimensional vector space for that to happen. It's called a trivial representation because it's sort of trivial. Everything goes to the identity. There's an even more trivial one, but they'd already used the word trivial for this one. So there's a zero-dimensional representation on the zero vector space, which sends a b minus b bar a bar to the identity transformation of the zero dimensional vector space. What is a zero dimensional vector space? Well, it, it can't have any axes. It just has the origin. So it's just a point. So the identity is now just sends the origin to the origin, does nothing else. I can't write that as a matrix because it's a zero by zero matrix if I, if I try. So I just write it as the identity. And that again is a representation. It's the zero dimensional trivial representation. Uh, no, zero representation. We've already used the word trivial. Okay, so we've got a zero dimensional representation, one dimensional representation, a two dimensional representation, a three dimensional representation. Are there any more? Well, there certainly are. So for any non-negative integer n, there is a well, an irreducible representation, which I will abusively call irrep uh, rn. This is r subscript n from su2 to GLNC. So for every integer we have an n-dimensional irreducible representation of SU2. Moreover, any irreducible representation R of SU2 on some vector space V is isomorphic to one of these. And you know which one it's isomorphic to because you know what the dimension is. Okay, I haven't defined what isomorphic means. I'll do that in a moment. This theorem is going to take us some time to prove. It's, you know, 
one of the highlights of the course, the proof of this theorem. Um, so what I'm going to do is first define what it means for the representation to be isomorphic. Then in the next video, I'll construct these irreducible representations. And then in the subsequent videos, I will prove the theorem. Okay, so what does it mean for two representations to be isomorphic? I need to tell you what a morphism of representations is. So definition. Given two representations of the same group, R from G to GLV, remember this is uh, invertible transformations from V to itself, and S from G to GLW, so V and W are vector spaces here, a morphism of representations from R to S is, well, it's supposed to be a way of comparing these representations. And first of all, we need to be able to compare the vector spaces. So it's a linear map, L from V to W, such that so what's the condition? I'm going to draw a picture. Um, so here's V and V, and going between them, we have for each element of the group, a transformation RG in our representation. Here's W and here's W, and here's a transformation going between them, uh, which is SG for the same group element G. Now we can complete this picture by drawing in maps L from V to W and L from V to W. And the condition we want is for this square to commute. In other words, if we go along RG and then down L, that is L composed RG, that should be the same as going down L and then along SG. That is SG composed L. It's called an isomorphism if L is an invertible map. in which case the inverse will be a morphism of representations from S to R. Um, let's just think about what this means. If V equals W equals CN, then L, and, and let's suppose L is an isomorphism, then L is just a change of basis. We can just think of L as changing basis of, of this vector space. And then, you know, the fact that SG equals uh, L composed RG composed L inverse is just saying, you know, we change basis, we have these matrices RG, and in the new basis, they become the matrices SG. So in other words, an isomorphism of representations is basically saying we can change basis so that the representations become the same. In other words, uh, representations are isomorphic if they're given by the same matrices when suitable basis is picked. I just want to do one example of this, and not for SU2, but for, for U1, because it's slightly simpler. So remember, we had this representation of U1 uh, into GL2C that took e to the i theta to the two by two matrix cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. And um, we also had this representation again from u1 to gl to c which sent e to the i theta to e to the i theta 0 0 e to the minus i theta and we said that this second representation was obtained by diagonalizing this first one so another way of saying that is these two representations are isomorphic so this is an example 
In other words, I need to write an invertible linear map from C2 to C2. That is a, a two by two matrix, such that, um, I should give these names, this is gonna be uh, R, this is gonna be S, so such that R of G equals L compose S of G composed L inverse. I guess this is actually a morphism from S to R. Um, doesn't matter because it's invertible anyway. And this is supposed to be the change of basis matrix that goes from um, be between these two guys. So I think we, we said what this change of basis matrix was last time, or whenever it was we discussed this example. Um, so this is uh, the change of base basis matrix is I minus I one minus one. No, one, one, that's not minus. Okay, so I claim this guy is um, a morphism of representations, an isomorphism of representations, and you can check. So in other words, you want to prove that uh, I minus I one one e to the i theta zero zero e to the minus i theta uh, and then L inverse is, well it's a two by two matrix so we should be able to invert it, right? So the determinant is two i, so this is one over two i times and then we get one i minus one i. So if you multiply all this out I claim what you get is cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta, where we're using the nice formulae for cos and sine in terms of e to the i theta. So cos theta is e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two, and sine theta is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over two i. So that's an exercise to check that. Once you've checked it, that you've proved that L is an isomorphism between these two representations. So this implies L is an isomorphism. In this case, it's from S to R. Okay, so in the next video, we will construct these irreducible representations of SU2 of any dimension.